Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dave. I'm the track host for this room for this afternoon. And I just wanted to introduce Mosin and uh, remind everyone to leave feedback on the Sketch app after the talk so we can tell Mosin how we all felt about it. Um, but with that, uh, Mosin talks about uh, Linkerd at WePay. All right. Thank you, David. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me today. I'm Mosin Razai. I'm uh, the software engineer at WePay, now a Chase company. Um, Super excited to be here talking about what we did last year to uh, essentially integrate uh, service mesh with our infrastructure and uh, migrate all of our production services and, uh, and traffic to Linkerd last year. Um, so to kind of get things started, uh, who's here have, have heard of Linkerd before? And who's played with Linkerd before? And who's in production? All right, <laughs> so this is a good this is a good crowd. Um, I hope <laughs> I hope you learn a lot from uh, you know what we learned last year from migrating. Uh, so to kind of uh, you know since this is about our journey, and I thought it would be appropriate to take a look at you know where we came from uh, pre mesh, and then uh, take a look at. Uh, you know, how we migrate with Mesh, I, I guess introduce service mesh to our infrastructure and then migrate our services to it. It's, a, it's really a two-step process. And uh, at the end, you know, take a look at a couple of options or, or examples of how we, you know, maintain the infrastructure going forward now that we have everything on uh, the infrastructure. Uh, so, Generally, as our, you know, as our business has evolved and our infrastructure evolved with the business, um, you know, we've kind of faced challenges uh, that I want to cover in this section. And uh, that sort of starts with, uh, sorry, <laughs> that starts with our business focus. So uh, at WePay, what we do, we empower businesses uh, using world-class uh, software uh, to be able to facilitate payments uh, through their, uh, for their users. And uh, so how do we do this? Uh, the way we do that is we provide public APIs, public payment APIs that um, our uh, payment partners use uh, to be able to synchronously authorize charge of payments. And uh, those are the payments they receive from their user. And so any successful payment that uh, goes through the system and uh, successfully are authorized, then they are captured in the background um, in, in, at a different time. So as a, to be able to provide that world-class payment APIs, uh, uh, you know, we, we, the goal is to provide a very high success rate for uh, all the payments that are being uh, authorized through, uh, through the system. So we want to be able to, uh, you know, minimize that fraction uh, fraction of uh, issues that happens. And since these authorizations are happening synchronously in the, through the system, uh, we want to make sure that any internal uh, infrastructure or service problems uh, don't really affect the users of the, the APIs. So a few years ago. Uh, this whole, all the pay, payment APIs were backed by a single monolithic application uh, that uh, all the synchronous uh, payment requests were going through it and it would validate all the payments. And then, uh, so we wanted to make sure us providing a highly available service, we want to make sure we have, we have internally an overall HA system. So we made use of a few monitoring services uh, to be able to you know, look at custom metrics, uh, you know, create custom checks and look at application performance uh, through all of these different things so we can cover an overall uh, high availability story. And if anything goes wrong, then there's an on-call team that uh, for anything that is not auto-healed, uh, then that on-call team kind of uh, digs in and starts debugging. So as our uh, monolith became the bottleneck for the whole infrastructure uh, and our engineering uh, teams started to grow larger than, you know, being able to collaborate on a single service. Uh, we started uh, refactoring that monolithic application into microservices. And 
uh, by, by doing that, we needed to find a solution to be able to host them. Uh, so we chose the managed uh, Kubernetes clusters and uh, uh, running those microservices as, as containers to be able to you know, serve the same uh, set of features in the background. And uh, so these, these microservices are all split into different uh, subnetworks and uh, in return into different uh, GK clusters to be able to kind of focus on the specific uh, set of uh, you know, logics in the background. So to kind of continue that HA story, we also uh, use the same uh, monitoring best practices and applied it to the microservices. So overall, we can continue uh, relying on the same monitoring services that gave us the, the good uh, HA story uh, all along until, uh, until this point. So now if we kind of focus a little bit and zoom in on the microservices, uh, the way uh, these microservices communication layer is set up is the Nginx is uh, fronting the containers to be able to provide the TLS uh, uh, termination. And then if you take an example of uh, service A calling service B uh, from cluster B to cluster A, uh, service A is configured to know the fully qualified name for service B. So what it does, it uh, tries to resolve the f that fully qualified name in its configuration. Once it has a, once it's resolved that, then it uh, sends sends its request over TLS to service B. Nginx terminates that cell and then uh, sends that request to service B. And then the same thing happens uh, for the communication between B and C. Um, so it doesn't matter where these services exist and what cluster they are, uh, they're all configured the same way to be able to find uh, one another in the same way. And so since these microservices are the only eyes in the communication layer, they're also responsible for creating their own tracing and you know, distributed tracing, if you will, in, a, in an old school way. Um, and they're also creating the metrics that's appropriate for knowing what's going on in the infrastructure. And that includes uh, any request numbers, any latencies, uh, so on and so forth. So you can kind of take that and uh, it's an open-ended kind of a world for metrics. So in this scenario, Prometheus collects the metrics from these microservices directly and uh, sends to, uh, since uh, they need to monitor the health check of these services from the eyes of all these other microservices. It calls uh, you know, Nginx to be able to uh, test the health of these services. So we've successfully been able to kind of develop that infrastructure that gives us uh, a few things. You know, end-to-end -end monitoring, we're able to monitor everything great. We're able to tell what's going on if something goes wrong in the infrastructure. Uh, every single piece in the infrastructure is you know, configurable, upgradable uh, independently, uh, and it doesn't matter where they live in, the, in that environment or data center. Uh, so, and certain things to a certain point are automated. Uh, and it kind of gives us what we need to be able to run the infrastructure uh, the way we want it. Uh, but this setup is super complex. And, uh, and complexity and being so closely integrated with these microservices, it doesn't really encourage big improvements on the infrastructure or the microservices that are using the infrastructure. So uh, we wanna kind of take this opportunity and start moving toward an infrastructure 2.0 where uh, we can start defining our infrastructure in code with, with an idea to be doing that. And through uh, being able to build a communication uh, platform where you know, communication protocol uh, configuration or changes are easier, uh, life cycle of that layer is easier, independent of how many services or where the services are running, and uh, be able to make use of more modern uh, technologies like uh, so software load balancing, um, you know, you, you might need to use specific algorithms in your software load balancing than you know, round robin, for example. Um, and then make it easier and take the, some of the responsibility that's really the infrastructure's uh, responsibility from the microservices so they can focus on developing the product more than uh, being concerned about uh, the infrastructure layers. So 
And that's essentially the goal of um, integrating with Service Mesh and uh, being able to simplify the infrastructure and make it more modern. And that really uh, involves three major steps. Uh, first is introducing Service Mesh to the infrastructure. That's its own le level of complexity. Uh, the other is integrating all the microservices that are not on Service Mesh and being be able to start moving their requests to Service Mesh. And that's both for receiving and sending uh, requests. And also uh, doing all that while we keep the high availability at the same level with the same uh, set of requirements. And uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that this new infrastructure is also highly available. So kind of recap on what service mesh is. A typical, you probably hear this everywhere right, in all the mesh talks. Um, a, service, a typical service mesh infrastructure includes two major components. One is uh, the data plane, which is backed by Linkerd in this scenario. And this is Linkerd 1, and I'll explain why. Um, and then uh, one of the reasons is because we're using Namerd for service discovery. And Namerd gives us that backbone for the control plane uh, in Linkerd 1x world. Uh, so what Namerd does, it watches the events that are going through the uh, API servers for the GK clusters. And since we're using the regional GK clusters here, uh, we also get uh, a GK master cluster or API server cluster where uh, you are given a load balancer with a set of backends uh, for different zones. So you're available in a region uh, with multiple, with, depending on where your cluster, which zones your clusters are set up with. So we also add that layer of uh, high availability to uh, be able to discover services in, in case zone C, for example, goes down and you're available in A, B, and C, you can still use A, B to be able to uh, watch the uh, events that are going through the cluster. And the same uh, kind of watch events uh, story happens for the, all the cluster that, uh, that are in that environment. So, and we call that a discovery scope. So you want to be able to discover all the things that are in the discovery scope, no matter if you're inside uh, GK or outside GK, which is another reason why uh, we're using uh, Linkerd1. Um, so layering this whole thing with the microservices uh, story, uh, you might already see that it's uh, simplified. You know, services making communications to one another, they're not, uh, they don't need to resolve anymore. Uh, you know, names. The Linkerd's uh, already have a mapping of all the uh, service graph, and so they can. So when service A is sending a request to service C, all it does it sends the request to its uh, Linkerd proxy, and that proxy takes it over, forwards it to the destination proxy in cluster A, and then that forwards uh, the request to service C. And the same thing happens uh, from service C to service B. So. So really, that data plane layer, uh, it provides uh, the tracing. So now that we've shifted the visibility or observa observability uh, from the services to that data layer, data plane layer. So these, uh, the proxies can now do the distributed tracing for the services. It doesn't matter what service is doing what call. All these proxies are aware of what's going on in the whole infrastructure and the scope that they're in. And they can also produce the right metrics. And this is, this is very important because now we're starting to refactor and take away the infrastructure responsibility from services and make it simpler for them. And uh, all we need to do is integrate everything with the proxies. So as far as the integration for the microservices with uh, Linkerd, uh, there, there are two options. Uh, you can and each have their pros and cons. Uh, the local option, which is uh, using a sidecar pattern in Kubernetes world, um, it uses, you know, it would use a local host with an outgoing port, which means send my request uh, uh, outside to the destination service with the API uh, request, request URI for the destination service. Uh, the other option is using a per node uh, configuration where uh, then you need to be able to, the, these services at runtime need to be able to uh, find their proxy that they need to send the request to. Uh, but the outgoing port and the API stays the same. 
So the challenge here is for the services to actually be able to find the right uh, place where these proxies are running uh, in the daemon set pattern. So, so since we have both Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes services, uh, we need to, uh, you know, we're using Linkerd1, and that's uh, the only way we can get a non-Kubernetes uh, connection in this infrastructure um, within the same discovery scope. So now Monolith needs to talk to service B uh, since it has a Linkerd proxy, it sends a request there, and then service B re receives it uh, from the, the proxy that's running in cluster A. So how that happens is with a semi-simplified DTAP that you see next to name or D. And so for REST, it's super simple. Like there's no, uh, the, the service discovery already handles uh, what's going on. For gRPC, it's a little bit simplified here because uh, you need to kind of uh, go through the gRPC header configuration to be able to uh, kind of map your gRPC packages to the actual service name that NameRD knows as a service name. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I encourage you reading our latest blog post about this. It goes into detail about how we configured both name, uh, both uh, well, I guess NameRD and LinkerD, but at the same time how we have our com applications use this configuration to be able to send uh, both REST and gRPC uh, requests at the same time. So since uh, both these clusters and non-Kubernetes non uh, services are in the same discovery scope, uh, then service A can also send requests to service C uh, by using the same name or D configuration. So I kind of mentioned this, but uh, Linkerd's and uh, the core telemetry pieces of name or D uh, expose more than 1,000 metrics points. So then you can start uh, gathering information about, you know, uh, on the client side, you can look at things like latency, uh, whether it's client latency or overall latency uh, over the wire between service, uh, you know, A and B. And then, uh, you know, request times and so on and so forth. And then on the server side, you can, take, you can look at a lot of other things uh, as, as internal resources. Um, any you know internal connectivity and then anything that could be a bottleneck for the for either Linkerd or Namerd, and you can map it in uh, uh, Grafana using Prometheus. And using that collected data and aggregated data in this uh, system, then you can uh, you know trigger things like uh, success rate drops below 100% for service X, and we can trigger an alert with Alert, uh, alert Manager and be able to kind of, uh, if it's not auto-healing, then uh, have people look at it and debug it uh, live. And that's where these dashboards come into play. And uh, you know, if you're looking at a success, overall success rate that's dropping, uh, then we can put that next to all these other dashboards uh, where it's showing internals and overall uh, health of the infrastructure and be able to live debug anything that's uh, not really visible from a service perspective or service logs uh, and you know, things that are outside this dashboard. So some example is that we've been able to easily tell you know, by migrating one of our services uh, had, uh, was running an old version of a Netty uh, HTTP client and we're immediately when we migrated to service mesh, we're able to tell that you know, a latency of more than um, you know, a delta of 50 plus uh, millisecond was uh, very visible and we were able to debug that back to the service and be able to fix that immediately without causing any, any more latency to the overall infrastructure. And uh, the other more interesting problem that we were able to solve with these was uh, NamerD uh, was leaking a lot, of, uh, a lot of memory, which was causing Kubernetes to force restart and then cause a lot of degradation uh, as the service was running. So all of this kind of puts us toward high availability. And, and I think this, is, this was the most important and most, uh, I guess, challenging part of uh, adopting this infrastructure. And uh, so avoiding all the internal health checking, because you can, you know, uh, since these are all running in Kubernetes, you can do a lot of liveness probes and a lot of tricks with internals to be able to have Kubernetes uh, watch all the pods as they're, you know, doing their thing uh, and restart them or, you know, the report back. But 
externally because that's, what, that's how Linkerd's are seeing service discovery in Namerd. Uh, we can then ask questions like, um, you know, if Namerd at all can respond to any discovery, is it, is it alive at all? Or if we can take an example for uh, discovering a service foo. Uh, we can ask question uh, through Namerd APIs that if, if I were to give you this service name, can you discover it for me? And so what we did internally, we also hooked up Sensu, because that's the one that's running the custom checks, uh, to a service registry that can automatically then, as services come alive uh, based on a certain, you know, uh, either a deployment or something that uh, registers the service with the system, be able to dynamically uh, either discover, uh, say, I want you to be able to make sure that these, ser these lists of services are discoverable. And, uh, as these services go offline, we want to kind of take them off that list. And that all happens using the service registry. So the other part of HA is uh, data plane. And this becomes more challenging because, uh, I mean, compared to the pre-mesh, because now we're looking at requests only going internally. So we can't really rely on external uh, custom checks from Sensu. Uh, so what we did, we implemented a probing service where it's idempotent and can you know, live anywhere inside, outside Kubernetes. And uh, it's able to handle both RESTful and gRPC. Uh, so what it does, it, uh, you, know, you send a request to it and say, I want you to check the health of the service C, for example, here. And uh, you, know, you tell it what protocol or data stream you want to use. And it will be able to tell you whether that service is healthy or not. And that kind of uses the, uh, you know, in the, the way we build our microservices, they use a, a framework layer for monitoring that uh, gives all of our microservices and this probing service uh, a layer where it can assume that any service that comes alive in the system, uh, it has that layer and we can ask it for a health check. We can say, uh, now service X comes alive in this infrastructure. Uh, can we route to it from pro uh, probing service to wherever it lives in this uh, discovery scope? So we're really kind of exposing that same observability uh, internally uh, from uh, instead of doing that externally through Sensu. And we can use all these, uh, the same channels as uh, for, for alerting. So uh, we can ask if, for example, a gRPC health fails for service C, we can trigger the right channels uh, for the right people to um, kind of jump on and take a look at. Of course, that's, again, if nothing, if, if it's something that doesn't auto heal. So what, with, with this, what we achieved, basically we've been able to refactor a lot of things outside of microservices and being able to kind of uh, simplify it uh, both at a configuration level and, and life cycling and be able to get the load balancing user, using Linkerd uh, to be able to kind of tweak all the algorithms for load balancing, for example. That's a very specific case and uh, be able to use the right algorithm in the right places in the infrastructure. And uh, since you know, the services now have less responsibility. A lot of times it's zero code and zero config for the services. So as they become live, it's easier for them to, uh, or I guess as, as they, developers are building these services, it, it, it becomes easier for them to kind of roll that out all the way to production without needing to worry about uh, extra pieces uh, that's outside of the product specs. So one thing that we're still working on and uh, was super challenging to deal with was distributed tracing using Linkerd. And the reason why that's challenging is because when you start introducing distributed tracing to uh, these proxies, then they start become uh, bottlenecks under pressure. So what we had to do, we had to do a workaround and, be able, and use other services like Instana to be able to give us the if we're using something more than, uh, something close to 100% sampling rate, then we can't really use the proxies to do the same uh, work as, as they're you know, under load and do the same uh, distributed tracing at the same time. So that's one thing that we're trying to kind of work with the uh, community to kind of fix. Uh, 
So now that we have everything on service mesh, uh, how do we you know, maintain things while we uh, make sure that there's no downtime and uh, high availability stays the same? Um, so to kind of put that in picture, uh, it's, it's really uh, about, you know, if we have all these, this is a snapshot of, you know, a couple of weeks ago from our service graph. And uh, each dot here is a service, it's not a pod. So each service multiplied by the number of pods that are running in the environment. And you want to make sure as all these little dots go in between these bigger dots, uh, then uh, we're not really affecting any live traffic as we're migrating or upgrading things uh, to newer versions or new configuration. So what we arrived at was our upgrade story also becomes the same thing as HA story. We split it into the control plane and uh, data plane. So control plane and NamerD, uh, so we built NamerD into its own, uh, you know, horizontally scalable uh, Kubernetes service where we're able to uh, kind of give enough information and configuration to each of these pods to be able to uh, discover all the things in the discovery scope on their own. So, uh, and these pods being behind the load balancer, we, then we can kind of play with all these different release strategies for NamerD. So whether it's blue-green that works or Canary, you want to test a new, uh, you know, uh, version that's you're not sure you're backward compatible or not, then you can do Canary and uh, get it tested through that uh, traffic that's going through the load balancer. So as far as data plane, it's, uh, the upgrade strategy becomes more interesting when you start using the daemon set pattern. And uh, it's easier for the sidecar because really the life cycle is tied to how the microservices are deployed and like what, what are their life cycle because each pod will get restarted on their uh, own schedule uh, based on deployments or health check and whatnot. But in this scenario, uh, if uh, we take an example uh, and use this as the, with, with the rolling upgrade pattern, Node A is uh, the first node that's uh, triggered to be upgraded. So when that's finished, then Node C is uh, being upgraded. Uh, so while Node C is being upgraded uh, and service one is trying to send a request to service two, uh, then that request will either fail or it will, and depending on the race condition, it will either fail or it, that node B uh, proxy already knows that node C is not available at the moment, and it will send a request to node A. And really, that's, uh, that's a responsibility of both uh, the this rolling upgrade uh, configuration and the services. And the reason is that because you need to make sure that if, if the service needs to retry things that are not retriable at the proxy level, then you need to be able to handle that at the service level. But there are things that, there are methods or APIs that you can retry at the proxy level, and you can configure that in Linkerd, and that would just give that uh, capability to all services with just one configuration. So I'm proud to say with this strategy that I described here, we were able to kind of migrate everything last year in production with zero downtime, and it was, it was huge for us. So that was it, uh, thanks for listening. And uh, I kind of scanned through a lot of things, and this is uh, on top is our engineering blog, and I highly recommend you go in there and kind of take a look at the, all the details of the stuff I talked about here. Thank you. All right, are there any questions? Hi, uh, just one question. Did you evaluate Istio? Did you evaluate Istio? Sorry, I can't hear. Did you evaluate Istio? Istio? Hmm. Uh, we did a lot of uh, kind of comparison between the two. And uh, at the time we were doing the migration to Service Mesh, the feature parity was way behind uh, Linkerd. So based on what we needed, we kind of decided to go with Linkerd at the time. Thank you. Yeah.
A great talk. Thanks very much. Lots to think about there. Thank uh, you. I'm kind of curious, and maybe it's a conversation for offline, but what's your thought with the whole Linkerd 1 and 2 split? Now that you've rolled out 1, do you see yourself migrating to Linkerd v2 or not? Right. So that's one of the other things we're working with the community and uh, with, really with the Boyan team uh, is trying to bring that non-Kubernetes side of the story to Linkerd 2. Uh, they're really great at getting all the features of one to uh, two, but uh, since the focus, it's been laser focused on Kubernetes, we're trying to kind of get everything first and then, so we're not really losing functionality, we're actually, at least we're feature parity when we go to uh, Linkerd2. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, nice talk, thanks. Uh, how do you manage changes to your service mesh? Because it's a very critical central component, and we had the cases where like version change would introduce uh, issues across the whole cluster. It wouldn't use? Uh, we're using Envoy, but uh, I guess the problem is probably mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it goes to about like how do you handle backward and compatible changes? Is that is that a question? Uh, more like uh, is, it can be a single point of failure, I would say. Right, and that's specific to the proxies. I'm assuming you're wondering. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of testing that goes into migrations uh, to or upgrades to new versions. And that really depends on what we see in our testing environment and in our staging environment and. Uh, I guess through all that testing and making sure that all these environments are in sync with each other, we are able to tell a lot of the problems in advance before we go to production. Do you mirror traffic maybe to your staging environments? Because that is what we found, what was the problem, because we couldn't simulate similar loads necessarily easily. Mirroring? Can you, can you elaborate on that? So our, uh, our testing environments are much smaller and simpler than production environments in, in terms of sheer right. traffic and patterns. Right. Uh, yes, so we have a lot of data that goes in our testing environment that's uh, copied from production that we can kind of simulate what's happening in production. In fact, we found a lot of the uh, like problems with load testing in our testing environment then before we actually even went to production uh, for migration to the, uh, all the services to it. Nice, thanks. Yeah. Any questions over there? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, you mentioned you developed a probe service that you attach to each uh, pod. Uh, I'm curious, uh, have you considered console? And uh, uh, well, that's, that's my first question. Yeah. Console for discovery? Uh, well, because console does the health checking that you've mentioned, like right. what the probe service does, and it could right. actually serve the whole discovery uh, process for you. I wonder why you haven't uh, chose that, said you developed your own. Right. Um, we did not use console for the containerized applications, but we've used it for the VM-based applications, which is more of an infrastructure services. Uh, and the reason for that was because we needed to add that layer of, uh, you know, agents. I'm not probably the best person to talk about this, but uh, it was really about the setup and like how much overhead it was for the microservices in the containers to be able to set up that same health checking mechanism as the non-Kubernetes services. Very nice talk. So you. as you asked at the beginning, there's a lot of people who are curious about Linkerd or service meshes in general, but they have not used them in production. So from a company has been using them in production, apart from all the features, which of course are very nice, what is the operational overhead, the difficulty of introducing it? Have you had any problems? Have you found yourself using Linkerd so far? The early problems. Like, um, I mean, so again, I guess the reason why it took a long time for us to kind of migrate all of our microservices was really the upfront load testing and you know figuring out exactly what could go wrong based on, and that's how really why we iterated so much on the HA story for the whole infrastructure. And uh, it was 
I guess it came down for us to like whether these extra hops will add latency to the overall request of the service. And, uh, and it didn't. I mean, even if it's like up to five millisecond, millisecond of uh, you know, latency, you're getting so much out of it that overall, by adding gRPC and everything that's kind of speeding up the whole uh, communication layer, uh, you're gaining something as opposed to losing the kind of worrying about that five millisecond. Are we out of time? I guess take one more question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you had a problem uh, with load on your proxies when you were doing distributed tracing. Mm -hmm. Is that something you expect to be different when you move to Linkerd2? Uh, so we were actually having a talk yesterday in a workshop. Uh, and apparently for distributed tracing, it's not going to be a problem that's going to be solved using the proxies. Because when you put these proxies under load, then they have just you know, so much resources left to dedicate to distributed tracing. And, and since they're, they're spans and you, know, you need to do 100% sampling to be able to get the whole picture of that span, uh, then you can't really rely on all these to be sh kind of shipping all the uh, tracing information at the same time under heavy load. So you can do lower than 5% you know, sampling rate, but that's really like, debugging something live, which is, you know, Linkerd2 gives it a, with TAP and all the other uh, great new features for debugging. All right, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. It's good to be here. <laughs>